everybody, and welcome to An Hour with Grace Burroughs. I'm your host, Nancy Northcott. I'm delighted to interview Grace tonight. She is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of more than 91 books spread over 10 series. She's also an attorney with a longtime interest in horses and riding and an avid romance reader, and we're going to chat about her career tonight. Welcome, Grace. Hello, and it's wonderful to be here. Well, it's great to have you and to get a chance to talk to you about your books. You already had a legal career when you started writing fiction. What led you to branch out in this direction? Um, my legal career focused almost exclusively on child abuse and neglect proceedings. And it was my job to represent the children and make sure that the court knew what the children wanted and that the children understood the proceedings and on and on. It is not a very happy place to practice law. Um, there are good outcomes, um, but they're also very sad cases. And uh, so I would come home from the law office and you know, do my little mommy thing. And then at the end of the day, as so many of us do, I would curl up with a book. Then it was typically a romance novel because friends and neighbors, I want that happily ever after. And uh, you know, I want my faith in humanity to be restored. So uh, this continued uh, trajectory of having read romance novels um, in junior high, back when we had such a thing and through college. And it was such a, a source of sustenance for me to know that my keeper authors were, were going to end my day on a good note. But I ended up in the office late one night and working on some deadline document, you know, that had to be to court the next day. And uh, it wasn't going very well. I had reached that sort of tired phase where things that you should be able to do in 15 minutes are taken forever. And I told myself, well, I have my emergency book with me because I brought a book with me everywhere. Doesn't everybody? Um, and uh, I said, I'll just read one chapter. And you know, having recharged my batteries, I will knock out this stupid motion or pleading or whatever. Well, this was an author uh, who was a pretty reliable keeper author for me, but something about the book and I just didn't click. Um, I don't think it was an off book. I think it was, you know, the mood I was in. And uh, I had that pernicious thought, I bet I could write one of these. And, you know, the rest is uh, history. I started, I wrote a scene right then and there. I just sat down and blah, 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 1,500 words, 2,000 words, something like that. And I contrasted the energy I brought to drafting that scene, and I did not know what I was doing, versus the energy I brought to drafting the motion. Um, it, which I had been trained to do and I was skilled at doing and had done thousands of before. And I just thought, wow, which one is more fun? And <laughs> that's a no brainer. Uh, so I built on that scene. The book eventually became Gareth. I think Lord of Rakes is his subtitle. Um, and uh, I had never had so much fun as an adult, so much uh, just sort of let's pretend. And then the idea that if you hone your craft, you can get paid to write stories. Well, that intrigued me because I knew child welfare law wasn't, you know, that, that wasn't the hill I wanted to die on. And um, I'd been doing it for a while at that point. So the idea that I could maybe be digging a little back door to my burrow uh, was just enthralling. And I am so grateful to all my keeper authors you know, for the, the trail they blaze and all the wonderful stories they've written. And I get up every day happy to write. Well, how did you make your first sale? Uh, kind of by accident. Um, I thought because I was a lawyer that I had thick skin. You know, I had seen people lose rights to their children. And uh, you know, I'd seen children killed in drive-bys, not with my own eyes, but they were my clients and um, other tragedies. And I thought, I'm a pretty tough cookie. 
But when it came to writing, I was all over again, the beginner, the person who knew nothing, the outsider. And I went to a, a little writer's conference and it felt to me like everybody in that room, and there were maybe 150, 200 people there, um, knew everything and I knew nothing. And they were tossing around acronyms I didn't understand and uh, you know, referring to things like an elevator pitch. And I wonder why do you throw elevators around? That makes no sense to me. But if you toss a telephone pole in Scotland, you know, that's how uh, unsophisticated I was about the business. Uh, so the, the first session of this conference was an agents and editors panel. And those people sat in the front of the room, like, you know, the, they knew everything and I couldn't even understand the questions, much less the answers. But I was there for the weekend and I figured this venue has a bar and I do not typically imbibe, but I'm going to treat myself to a white Russian. And <laughs> it, it is still my treat drink. Um, I went to the bar and I ordered myself a white Russian. I figured I'm just going to go up to my hotel room and I'm going to write. I can at least do that. I can write. And there was a woman at the bar who had a knitting bag. And I remembered that one of the people on that Smarty Pants panel had a knitting bag. And I turned to her and I said, am I supposed to pitch you? And she got this smile on her face like, Oh, Lordy, I'm at another writer's conference. The woman happened to be Deb Worksman, uh, who is, I think, a, now a director or a managing editor at Sourcebooks. At that point, her job was acquisitions. And she was so kind. She said, would you like to pitch me? And at that point, every coherent thought in my head flew out the nearest ear. And I forgot the names of my characters. I had trouble forming coherent sentences. I had the equivalent of stage fright. And she pulled a pitch out of me, you know, tell me about your favorite book. And uh, it ended up with, well, she said, why don't you send me what you think are your best three? I had no idea what my best three were. And so I sent her three and she said, well, I'm interested, but send me three more. And this went on over a period of months. Uh, and finally she made an offer and uh, that started the ball rolling back in 2010. Um, and it, it was quite an education, you know, going through the, the traditional publication process. But you know, I am very lucky that I was in the right place at the right time. I ran into the right person. And eventually I showed her the right books. But so many pieces of Swiss cheese had to line up. You know, what if I had stuck to my guns and, you know, stayed for the whole panel or for the mixer afterward? Or what if I hadn't asked her a simple question? Or what if she had said to me, oh, well, you're supposed to sign up for the appointments on Tuesday. Any dummy should know that. Um, but it worked out. So I'm, I'm just pleased because it's been fun we well, you know a lot of people who are really composed and do a lot of oral presentations as you do as as a trial attorney or we're doing at the time as a trial attorney have trouble telling people why you should buy my book as opposed to why you should be on this person's side you should do what will help this person and yet it's, when it comes to a book, it's why you should like what this thing that I personally have done. And so really it's, would you say that it's a whole different kind of presentation? It is a whole different kind of presentation. And also uh, as a, a female in particular is up against a cultural perception that when she is advocating for somebody else, then she is strong and virtuous and articulate. When she is advocating for herself, she is pushy and arrogant and unfeminine. And, uh, you know, I was raised in this culture, so I'm sure that handicaps my ability to be a self-advocate. Well, I'd like, I'd like to go back to something you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. You said you were sitting in your office and you just wrote a scene 
and it turned out to be a scene from Gareth. Are you usually a linear writer or do you write scenes as they come to you or what, what method do you have for organizing the story and going through it to put it on paper? I, I think this is a, a question. The analogy that comes to mind to me is the iceberg. And some of us are writers who have to see the whole iceberg and others of us are writers who say, what was that? I think that was the tip of an iceberg. And we start paddling out there. Um, but the iceberg is the same. It's just a matter of what process you use to discover it. I have started writing a, a book on the strength of a single line of dialogue. Uh, the last thing he needed was an intelligent wife. I just woke up one more morning and heard that thought in some guy's Scottish accented self-talk. And I didn't know, well, what's the matter with you, dude, that you don't want a smart wife? Tell me the rest of it. And it has been an evolving um, sort of Rubik's Cube for how do you take uh, an organic process and make reliably good books out of it? Because it's really scary, you know, to think, I need to come up with a whole story here. It's got to have subplots and secondary characters and symbolism and unifying symbols and a theme and all this stuff. And I've got one line of dialogue. This is not a very sound plan, uh, but it's, it is the way I work where I'll start with a little bit of sort of eavesdropping on my characters as they find themselves in a predicament but a predicament or a premise is not a book. And so then you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, what is the one thing they're not willing to do to solve this predicament? What is their worst fear? What is their defining trauma? What is their family trauma? And you just keep rummaging around in all of this character material, or I do, and eventually something emerges that you know has legs, you know that's got momentum, you know that's not quite what the reader's expecting, but it could work. And, uh, you know, then clickety click, click, you write and write and write. Um, and, you know, so far, this sort of not overdriving my headlights approach to writing has worked. But I have been told, and I believe, that if you write long enough, there comes along a book that is not going to play by your rules. If you're to write that book and you are to write it, then you're gonna to have to do the aspect of process that has eluded you thus far. And for me, that might be outlining um, or it might be through lining. Um, I'm not sure what my uh, unexercised process muscles will turn out to be, but so far I'm a pretty organic writer. You've written contemporary, several contemporary romances, but the majority of your books are historical. Why did, how did you decide to focus on a historical time period first? I am old enough that when I started reading romance, historical is all there was. You know, there, uh, Danielle Steele hadn't come along yet. And uh, it was all knights in shining armor and dukes and the occasional Viking. Um, but there simply were not contemporary heroes or heroines or premises. Um, and, you know, even I think paranormal got going more strongly than contemporary for a while. Uh, so it is, uh, my, my keeper shelf is mostly full of uh, historicals. I think there are many historical authors that because they have been writing so long, their craft is superb. And, uh, you know, they've, they've been through the ups and downs and in industry gyrations and, uh, you know, they know what makes their voice unique. And I really enjoy reading them. The Mary Bailogs and uh, Loretta Chases. Julianne Long, there are just some outstanding talents. So on the one hand, I grew up reading historical. On the other hand, I think some of the best writing role models 
have been writing historical or they were as of 10 years ago. I mean, there's talent in every subgenre and phenomenal talent, but I was exposed to the historical talent um, and that shaped my appetites as a reader. Uh, but also I like the historical context for several reasons. Firstly, everybody is an expert on real life. You know, everybody has seen a courthouse. Everybody uh, has gotten a, a parking ticket. There are plenty of people who know the layout of downtown DC. And so writing contemporary has a particular challenge in that regard in that you are writing very close to reality. And most people feel pretty strongly about their perspective on reality. So it's a, a careful balancing act in terms of world building. Um, how close to real reality do you go? Uh, and I um, feel more comfortable working with historical reality. I think there's more latitude. Uh, we have different perspectives on it. And you can mine historical contexts for current themes, such as women's empowerment, militarism, um, gentrification, and uh, do so at a distance of 200 years and get your message across without um, pushing buttons. So, you know, I like that sort of historical, mm, what would you call it, distance. Mm -hmm. Well, and following up on that, your first series that was published was historical, and that was the Wyndham family. How did you come up with that, this particular family? I did not. Um, I, I met the Wyndhams as I was writing The Lonely Lords, and I, I came across, I think it was Douglas's story, where there was this officious, meddling, difficult Duke, uh, who was in fact the villain. And uh, he was the villain for reasons which became understandable. Um, but the way he went about um, pursuing his objectives was just scurrilous. Uh, you know, it was arrogant. Um, but lo and behold, he came equipped with a duchess who could cut him down to size with a raised eyebrow. And I thought, who do I know like this? Well, my parents were married for more than 70 years. And it was a very traditional union where, you know, dad was the breadwinner and mom stayed home with seven kids. But I knew very well that it was a power sharing arrangement. Um, that uh, it was a division of labor along traditional lines, but it was not a matter of one person was the Duke and the other person wasn't. There were, you know, it was a Duke and a Duchess uh, in my family. And so being the sixth of seven children, writing a large family uh, just feels like home to me. And uh, you know, so I met this Duke and I met his oldest sons and just sort of uh, figured, well, this is an interesting family. So I finished up a few more Lonely Lords and I thought, well, why don't, now, I would like to know more about what's going on with the Wyndham family. So I wrote a few more books for them. You know, I wrote a book for the, the beleaguered heir and I wrote a book for uh, the pianist. I have a degree in music history. That wasn't all that big a stretch. Um, and not only that, I have a degree in music history because I cannot perform at the keyboard. I fall apart. My hands shake too badly. Uh, so I thought, why don't I give this guy, this hero, one trick? He'll be a heck of a pianist. And then I'll take that away from him. Well, you can see this is fun. This is interesting. These people are, uh, you know, asking to have their stories written. So uh, when I pitched to Deb Worksman, she eventually lit upon, after sifting through many manuscripts, the first three Wyndham brothers as my initial trilogy. And that was very shrewd of her, um, you know, because brother trilogies, they have some traction right out of the gate. And they did 10 years ago and they still do now. Um, and then it was uh, a comb it was a, a discussion with her about whether to do the trilogy and then 
you know, do some lonely lords or start another family or do the sisters. And she said, well, why don't you write one sister? Give me a Christmas book for the sister. And that was Lady Sophie's Christmas Wish, which has been a reader favorite since forever. You know, it's Christmas, it's got a baby. And um, the, the other sisters just naturally followed suit. They all had interesting tales to tell. So I'm uh, lucky, you know, that I got a big family to cooperate with me for an initial series because it gave me time to develop momentum um, and it gave me one world to work with um, for eight straight books and a couple novellas, four novellas, I think. So that was, a, that was a good way for me to get started. For somebody else, it might not have worked, but for me, that was fun. When I have a particular soft spot for Devlin St. Just, um, the veteran of the Waterloo campaign, could you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this particular character? Yes. Um, so I'm writing along the air, the first book in the story, and I've met our hero, um, and uh, he's a nice enough guy, has some problems. And then you meet his younger brother. And younger brother's a good supportive younger brother, as younger brothers are supposed to be. And I think, well, that's nice. Brothers should get along. And the uh, West Haven, the hero from the air, is out riding in the park one morning. And it's a foggy morning. And from out of nowhere, this other fellow on a horse appears. And he turns out to be the illegitimate firstborn brother. I did not know there was an illegitimate firstborn brother, but it made all kinds of sense, um, particularly given that um, Percival, our Duke, the patriarch, was raised in the Georgian era, which was nowhere near as fussy as the Victorians want us to think the Regency era was. Um, so for a Duke's son to have a by blow would have been absolutely nothing remarkable. And uh, it, my mother's antecedents uh, were Irish and uh, Ireland, I think is underrepresented in historical romance. There's fascinating history there and tremendously rich culture. And um, I, I wanted to get in one for mom. So I made St. Just half Irish. And, uh, you know, he has turned out too to be a reader favorite. He shows up in the Captive Hearts trilogy. Um, and uh, he's just something about that man appeals to a lot of readers. Yeah. Well, and, you know, speaking of the Duke and Duchess of Moreland, they not only appear in the Lonely Lords, they kind of pop up in lots of different places. Is there any particular thing that inspired you to have them do that? They, they appear from time to time, which is, is fun for readers, but I just wonder why you decided to do that. Well, because I think like many romance authors, before I was an author, I was a reader. And when you see one of these Easter eggs, as we call them, it's like, oh, I know him. I know him and his horse's name and what, you know, his preferred scent is. And I know that he used to stammer. I know him. I know him. It just makes you light up. Like when you see a friend across the room um, and uh, you may not have time to say more than hi, we should do lunch, but it still brightens your day. And, uh, you know, so it is with uh, my characters, if I had it to do over again, I would probably write more in silos um, because particularly from a chronological perspective, my list has some pretty rough seams where if you read these five books and these five books, it's very hard to get them to do this um, because they weren't published in the order they were written. But uh, I felt as if Percival and Esther were my foundation couple. And not only that, in the world I write in, they were a very powerful couple. Uh, so for them to have their fingers in this pie and know everybody and turn up at all the, um, the A-list dues made sense. It was consistent with the world. Well, and they seem to come along to lend a helping hand now and again, like to Quinn Wentworth, for example. Um, yes. 
They are a little bit of a deus ex machina. Um, you know, you know, if Percival and Esther show up, things are going to improve. Usually they're not going to get worse. Um, and I hope that's a reflection of the fact that if we have a lot of power and influence, we should be using our powers for good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also have several other family groups, the Dornings, the Haddonfields, the Wentworths, and you just wrapped up the Dornings with Sycamore. And they also are favorites of mine. So what gave you the idea for this big kind of rackety family to fill out one of your series? Well, the, the Dorning family um, is in part uh, just a stray thought because I wrote Worth Lord of Reckoning as a, um, a one-off, a standalone. I don't know where it came from, but that too has been a reader favorite. And, um, you know, Worth is an arrogant guy. He can make money, money on top of money on top of money. He's very good at money, but he's not so good at people. And he has a troubled family history. And as much money as he has, he is that impoverished in terms of loving relationships. And so his story was big fun to write uh, because he came across this lady who had a bazillion siblings, um, eight or nine siblings. And uh, you know she knew all about family and she was gonna straighten him out. In the course of their story, her seven brothers show up. And I thought, what the heck? What is this? Seven brides for seven brothers? Who writes this stuff? Uh, and I didn't think much of it at the time other than that's a lot of brothers. I have four. Four is a lot. And uh, I, you know, went on about my merry way writing other books. But time goes on and we become aware that writing always the privileged alpha male is it, it can be fun, um, and the bigger they come, the harder they fall, and the bigger they come, the more they need to fall um, in a romance context. But I thought, well, what about something a little more realistic? What about the fact that so much of the landed gentry was struggling as the Industrial Revolution came along, and um, you know, prices went all over the place as 20 years of Napoleonic warfare went on, and you couldn't just live off the land anymore. And here's a family with a ton of people to support. And the old system of living off the rents is just not working. What are they going to do? How are they going to adjust? What can they do that's realistic, has integrity, um, and, you know, of course, involves meeting the love of their lives and growing sufficiently that they are worthy of the loves of their lives. And it just to, to come down a step from the Duke who never had to worry about money and uh, can sort of manipulate the strings of power behind the scene, that was fine for a place to start. But the Dorning family let me um, take a step closer to reality and closer to the reality that most of us live, which is how am I gonna pay the bills? And uh, in some ways, that was a more interesting challenge because when you are strapped for cash, it is very tempting to compromise your honor. It's very tempting to take the shortcuts, you know, and to the wink winks. And, uh, you know, to, to walk those walks as opposed to just waltz around the Mayfair ballrooms was uh, good stuff to write. So that's, that's where the Dornings came from. Well, the true gentleman and the lonely lords are not so much all one set of siblings, either series, and yet they intersect at various points. And did you plan that when you started out or did that kind of organically grow as you were writing those series? The analogy I use is a spider plant where, you know, it sends out a shoot and you think, oh, that's nice. I should probably cut it off and put it in water. You know, but then whoops, there's another shoot coming out here and the shoots have shoots. And pretty soon you've got this Gertrude McFuzz kind of tail. And um, that's a Dr. Seuss analogy, meaning it's far more uh, kind of complex and grandiose than I had envisioned. And uh, it, 
you know, as I said, if I had it to do over, I would write a tidier world, but I don't. And, um, you know, if, it, if it's a, a world that does not appeal to a reader because it's too complicated and interwoven and messy, that reader will find other books and we'll all wish him or her well and everybody should read what they enjoy. Well, to switch gears a little bit, you took a contemporary turn with your Highland Holidays and Trouble Wears Tartan series. Was there anything in particular that inspired the shift in direction? I just love Scotland. I love Scotland to pieces. And uh, the, the chunk of my family that's not from Ireland is from Scotland. And uh, I just, I love the scenery. I love the uh, sort of scrappy nature of the national history. Um, there's just so much to admire about Scotland and I like going there. So uh, at one point I was convinced contemporary is big and kilted laddies are big. So the next big thing is gonna be Scottish contemporary. Well, the wave has yet to hit the shore. Um, but when it does, I'll read every one of them. Um, I liked doing a little change of scene but in reality, when I write contemporary or Victorian, it just doesn't sell as well as my Regencies. Um, I am working on a Regency mystery series, but there again, I don't expect it to sell as well as my Regency romances. It's sort of a selfish indulgence um, and just a frolic and detour. Well, didn't you take a reader group to Scotland at one point? On a in 2016, a very small group, I think there were not much more than a dozen of us, uh, and we stayed in a country house in Perthshire and did little day trips. Um, we also spent a couple days in Edinburgh because you typically do that so that lost luggage can find you um, and jet lag can unfind you. Uh, then we popped down to Sir Walter Scott's uh, manor house in the borders, Abbotsford, and then we went up uh, to Perthshire and just, if you wanted to do the outing that day, you could do it or you could stay, you know, in your little Highland hideaway and read books. It was a lovely week. Well, in the back of one of the books in the series, and I'm blanking on the title, it's the one about the whiskey distillery. There was something about being in a bar and four lads in kilts came in and you thought they would, it would be fun to do something with something like that. It's the one, it's the Bar J, the Logan Bar. Uh, Tartan Two Step is the name of the book. Okay. I'm sorry, because I just, I had it in my head and I couldn't. Yeah. Um, it's set in Montana, but the, and this is part of the Trouble Wears Tartan series, um, in which the premise is you take a yank and a, Scotsman or a Scotswoman and an American fella and team them up and oh I had fun I got to write sort of a kilted cowboy and uh, it's I've, I think about adding to that series to be honest um, but you know Regency is my bread and butter and my home and uh, it, it's it has to come first put it that way. Well you know one of the things that was interesting about that particular book was the discussion of what makes a good whiskey and the nuances of nose and flavor and finish in a whiskey. And was that something that you had already studied or did you get dig into it for that book? Um, both. Uh, my dad's area of research was for a long time flavors and fragrances. So he would sit at the head of the dinner table and say, Mama, you know, this has that old dirty gym sock flavor. Is there a little cumin in this? And, um, you, you know, so he was aware of flavors and fragrances. And my mother did not kill him. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so I, I was raised to be aware of flavors and fragrances. And I delight, especially in fragrances. Um, I have toured 
probably a half a dozen Scottish distilleries. And I do enjoy uh, not too peaty whiskey. Um, and uh, the, the sort of little twinkle in that uh, book is if you go to the Dewar's distillery in Aberfeldy, they'll tell you, and it's, it's, it's marvelous marketing, but they'll tell you that whiskey has three ingredients and one of them is water. And uh, so the, the water that you're starting with is important and it is myth or legend or folklore that Dewar's whiskey is made with water that has a trace of gold in it. And I just thought gold, 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 Montana. There's gold in Montana. There could be gold. Ooh, you know, and off I went. Um, had another book to write. And so uh, it's, it's just curious how little twinkles will connect things that you think are disparate and what fun it is to write about them. Well, you know, and one of the things that to me made that trilogy interesting was for years, I've heard the conventional wisdom is don't write a land development plot. And each of those books has some aspect of land development in it. And yet it, it's not a two dogs, one bone situation between the hero and heroine, which I think is one reason those were frowned upon. So when you were, were working on those, did you think of that as a potential landmine or did it just grow from the original concepts for the books? Well, I am concerned about land development. You know, I live in rural Maryland and I'm fortunate that my neighborhood is zoned agricultural conservancy. So it will never become a development. Um, and the issues I raise about, you know, the developers want good farmland. They don't want scrubby old hillsides. Um, and it takes generations to bring farmland to its peak uh, yields. And um, we're just gobbling up farmland left, right, and center. There's a whole nother layer to the discussion in the sense that population over the next generation or so has peaked. You know, it's, we don't need to feed as many people as we are feeding now. Um, but uh, I think it's a juicy issue. And the, they tell you in conflict manager school that the thorniest issues, the ones that are hardest to resolve are two party, one issue at the level of a value. You know, not an, an issue about what movie are we gonna see tonight, but is security more important than freedom? Um, is privacy more important than security? Uh, th those things that you, you just, we all have a different perspective and the one you hold is very hard to let go of. Um, and I think land use is such an issue because once the land has been developed, it's gone. You know, it, no more cornfield from there. Uh, but people need places to live and communities need tax bases. So there are a lot of ways you can plug in and create a dialogue around why do we feel what we do in this regard? Um, and I guess I didn't listen about that never use land use because boy, in Scotland, land use is a huge issue. Um, you know, the, it, it goes back hundreds of years. And it does in uh, the rest of the UK too. Uh, some of the first um, acid rain cases were brought by Welsh farmers in the 1760s because all of the smelting um, and uh, ironworks was destroying the arability of their land. The sky was so dirty you know, that it was polluting the soil and they couldn't grow their crops. And they lost, unfortunately. There was a lot about agricultural conservancy in one of the books in that series. And then you've also written on a wide range of other topics. Music, you said you had a, de a degree in music, writing, post-traumatic stress, dog training, herbalism, knife throwing, cooking and adaptations for people with physical challenges. I, from reading your biography, it sounds like you've got a background in music and in writing. 
and you've just told us you have a background of interest in agricultural conservancy. But do you have a background in all these other things or did you have to research them? And if so, can you tell us a little about your process? Well, uh, I think research is one of the perks of being an author. Um, you know, you can make touring a chocolate factory into a research excursion. Um, what kind of job lets you do that? Uh, but it's also the case that as a child welfare attorney, I came up uh, against just about every variety of human ailment you can have. Everything in the diagnostic and statistical manual, every family dysfunction, every crime that can be committed. And uh, this turned out to be pretty good education for writing characters uh, in the sense that, um, you know, you, one of my judges, judges used to say, you can't make this stuff up. Um, the things that people get up to in a family context are just amazing, not always in a good sense. So I think uh, being a child welfare attorney forced me to learn about addiction, about PTSD, about OCD, about um, separation anxiety, you know, so many of the, the things that hold us back um, show up in the courtroom. And we do stupid things because of our unresolved trauma and uh, the sad things. So I would say the, the lawyering years were enlightening in, in terms of uh, the material that I need to write good books. But I also just delight in, um, you call it research, but um, to be creative, you have to confront your brain with new material, things that it hasn't seen before. And then it goes scurrying around trying to find connections to help figure out where to fit all that new stuff in. Like, what do you do with the fact that there might be gold in the water that is made, used to make Dewar's whiskey? But if you never learn that there could be gold in the water and you never learn about um, Montana's gold rush, <clears throat> those two little twinkles can't connect. So to have uh, a mind that delights in novelty is a helpful thing for an author. And this is not encouraged in our formal education. You know, we're told to get the grades and buckle down and focus and choose a major. And so much of effective writing is not choosing a major. You know, it's a butterfly, another butterfly. Woo, do butterflies fall in love? You know, it's spontaneous and it's driven by curiosity. Well, shifting gears, a few of your books are darker. I mean, I wouldn't say that you write light comedy, so that's not what I'm coming at from this, but a few of your books are darker than others. The Soldier, The Captive, My One and Only Duke, The Truth About Dukes, and some of the backstory of the Wyndham family. When you're dealing with these darker subjects, how do you approach constructing the story and characters knowing that they're gonna be darker than some other works of yours? My darkest trilogy is probably the Captive Hearts. Um, which dealt with torture. It dealt with disfigurement. It dealt with uh, harm to a child. And um, most of that off the page. But um, I went there because I was so angry about some of those issues. Um, and uh, I believe that love is for everybody everybody. And I was pretty determined uh, to make that point. Um, so I think how I deal with it is a matter of the theme. And if the theme is we are all deserving of love um, or that uh, Love might be terrifying because it's transformative, but transformation is often the only way out of a serious trauma. 
And if I want to get those points across, I have to go there. I mean, I, I have to um, go to the shadowed side of the room. I don't have to stay there for every book. But the other thing is having written those stories, I don't need to write them again. I said that already. Um, and the uh, Captive Hearts is by no means my most popular trilogy. In fact, there were readers who said, ew, you know, what did you do? You used to be so fun. Um, but there are other readers who have said, that's my best work. And, uh, you know, I think somewhere between the two, it's too dark and it's my best work is probably uh, a fair representation of reality. Well, your new series, at least based on its title, is pretty far from darkness. It's a Mischief in Mayfair. And you're just kicking that series off. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, yes. Um, Mischief in Mayfair is, so far, it's a trilogy. Um, who knows where it'll end? Uh, and it started off as a spinoff from um, the uh, True Gentleman or from the Dorning family in that in the last True Gentleman, number 12, um, our, finally, the youngest son gets his story. And uh, he falls in love with a woman who comes complete with a grouchy brother. And the grouchy brother is kind of beat up around the edges. He wears an eye patch. He doesn't hear all that well. In cold weather, his hip seizes up. And I'm thinking, this is hero material. This, this fellow is just so dear. Um, and he's so gruff and grouchy. And I just better write him a story. And um, here again, I have written a lot of titled heroes and titled heroines. And these people have money. And it seems like you know, they are awash in privilege, which can make... Um, personal growth much harder, by the way. Um, but uh, I thought, you know, most of London was not awash in privilege. Most of London was having a pretty hard time, um, particularly in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. And um, it occurred to me that focusing on that, on sort of the historical ups and downs, the fact that habeas corpus was suspended in Regency England. Um, you know, the state of the prisons was awful. And uh, something like one out of every five women was involved in prostitution. It wasn't illegal. Um, that, let's, let's go a little bit on that side of the street um, and deal with people who are maybe uh, a little more careworn, um, a little more trying to figure out as we all are how to pay the bills, how to raise the kids, how to keep a roof over our heads. And so I went with veterans, um, you know, fellas who had all known each other and they're all cousins um, so far. And they fought together in Spain and they all bring baggage back. And the first hero, part of his baggage is that his mother was French. And at the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, something like a quarter of all the aristocracy had French cousins. And you can see France from Dover. You can look over there as France um, and literally swim to France. So it, uh, it, it was a little bit more like a civil war when Napoleon you know, began antagonizing England then we grasp. Um, there were tremendous sort of commercial connections. England needed those continental markets. Um, the continent needed England's industrial expertise. It was uh, a terrible idea to have a war. Um, so I went with veterans and the first fella looks after street urchins and there are reasons why he is drawn to doing that. The second fella looks after street walkers and the reasons why you know, there's specific trauma that he's trying to resolve um, by devoting himself to this cause. And the third guy, so far what I know about him is he looks after wounded veterans. So these men are all trying to atone. They're all trying to um, make a contribution 
at the same time that they themselves aren't doing very well. Um, they may be the butt of scandal. Uh, they may be coming a little bit unwrapped mentally. Um, they may be homesick or financially challenged. So th these are really interesting characters to work with. And I'm just having the best fun. I can, um, and at the same time, these are happy stories because they, they meet and fall in love with wonderful people. And by you know backsliding and slipping and slithering and thrashing, they find their way to that happily ever after. And it's very gratifying to see you know people who are kind of struggling on page one, struggling a lot on page one, end up with the brass ring at the end of the book. Well, and and you said that was going to be a trilogy at least right now. So is there a possibility that that some character might come riding out of the morning mist in Hyde Park who will need a book of his or her own? Well, in the first book, there was a, a, a French champagne dealer, Fournier. Mm -hmm. And oh, he was just so charming. He stole the scene. And I thought, you know what happens to people who steal scenes. Um, you know, there's a story there. He too, he's, uh, he's an emigre, he's French, he's trying to make a living in London. Why is he staying in London when it wasn't particularly welcoming to the French? What's going on there? Inquiring minds want to know. Um, you know, so I could see him shuffling into line there around book four or five. But the author is sometimes the last to know. Yeah. Well, he was an interesting character because of that, because at first the Dornings are mad at him because he's gouging them on the champagne prices. And the hero thinks he might be behind the problems he, meaning the hero, is having. And then at the same time in the Scottish series, Max Maitland starts out not the most sympathetic character because he's Violet's nemesis. And yet as the book goes on, he becomes more and more sympathetic. And that's kind of unusual for a budding romance hero. It happens, but it's not as popular as the best friend or the brother or the cousin or the war buddy. And was there a particular reason that you chose to kind of start these guys out this way and then add some layers that said, hmm, possible hero? I think it's more interesting. Um, you know, if, if every hero toes the starting line or every hero in toes the starting line and has only 40 yards to dash. Well, that's not a very big character arc. You know, that's, um, you know, a couple of revelations and maybe some regret and a few insights and boom, you're done. But if your character is starting 20 yards back and, you know, sort of not paying attention when the gun goes off, then that character has to really hustle to climb the whole character arc. And um, it, it's a way to add tension to the book, to push your character farther back than the starting line. Um, because the reader is wondering, how are you going to do this? How are you going to, this fella lacks charm. This fella has not saved a kitten yet. And, uh, you know, you, to, to walk that line between reader you have to root for this person. I'm going to show you, um, we can peek here and see that truly there's a heart of gold and there are aspirations and there are reasons why he or she is so grouchy. But all you get is a peek, you know, and then it's on to chapter two. As a, a reader, I think that's a more interesting read. And as an author, it's a bigger challenge, um, you know, to take somebody like uh, in The Traitor in the first book, we meet somebody, you know, whose job is interrogating English prisoners, and uh, he is not very pleasant about it. Uh, I think in some ways, The Traitor is my best book, because I could rehabilitate somebody and show that he was put in a terrible position, and, you know, um, by the end of the book, betrayal um, has been sort of handed around to a lot of other parties that you didn't anticipate. And instead of that, he is no longer the traitor. 
And uh, I just think that if an author can do that, if they can keep your reading, keep you interested and engaged and keep you guessing, that's probably a pretty well-written book. Well, we're coming up, actually coming up on time. So would you please tell us where readers can find you and what's next for you? Uh, readers can find me at graceburrows.com, but like a fool, I chose a pen name that isn't always uh, self-evident in terms of spelling. It's Burroughs, B-U-R-R-O-W-E-S, because that spelling in terms of domain names was not taken. Um, and uh, that's, you know, my website is the best place to find me. I am not on social media much, but I'm on Facebook some. Um, my favorite thing if you know you want to just stay in touch with what are you writing and when is it coming out is follow me on bookbub um that's it's a site i enjoy and i occasionally do uh, recommend books there but uh i would say either bookbub or the website and in terms of what's next i will continue with the mischief in mayfair series and I am publishing my Lady Violet Mysteries all at once at the end of the year. You can't find pre-order links for them yet because I'm going to kind of blitz this. It's a half dozen mysteries with uh, a very uh, prominent romance arc running through the series. And I've just had the best fun. The books are a little shorter. They move along. Um, they're a little more... Uh, oriented toward the dramatic arc as opposed to the character arc. Uh, but I can see sticking with that series for quite a while. Well, Grace, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And I'd like to thank everyone who listens and watches this interview. And remember, you can always find us on Continual, the con that doesn't end. <laughs>